Welcome to another LNB review slash teardown video. Before we get started, I just want to say that the satellite reception series is not going anywhere. The next part, which I have planned, is finally about HRPT reception. However, as you probably are aware already, there is currently a, a developing situation with one of the Russian weather satellites. And I want to wait for that to be over first before I make the HRPT video so that the information I put into it doesn't immediately become obsolete if, if something happens. So in the meantime, I thought I would take a look at another LNB and there is a good reason for that, which you will learn very soon. Uh, so first some context, I bought an LNB like this last year, probably around September or, or maybe earlier. The most important thing being that I bought this brand new uh, it's supposed to be brand new and I turned this LNB on, I, I, I connected to the SDR, powered it up and it was horrible. The frequency offset was probably closer, close to a megahertz off and if you remember I said with the when looking at the Tesla LNB or maybe I said that, I don't know, but what I wanted to say was that the frequency change or local oscillator frequency being different doesn't really matter that much for satellite reception or for satellite television reception. It does matter for amateur radio purposes, but a standard satellite TV receiver would generally not be bothered. However, this LNB was so bad, it was the, the offset was so bad that I, for example, I do believe there are some that are only a few megahertz wide for satellite radio and those may actually be affected by this LNB. So what I ended up doing with the original LNB, this is not the original, is I took that apart, took a look inside, and it turned out it is an it's an old DRO LNB with with the PCB inside being dated something like 2012 maybe. So for the first time ever on this channel, I actually may be able to convey some useful information to you if you are going to be buying this LNB for actual TV reception purposes. Just don't do it. Don't do it. Get get one of these instead. Make sure it's a PL LNB. But because this is an, a DRO LNB, I thought it would be interesting to take a look inside and see the differences between this and the Tesla LNB, which I have over here. So, as I said, this is not the original LNB, because after I took it apart and realized it is DRO and realized that the LNB is not actually very good, I did what any reasonable person would do, I believe, and I bought five more of them. And... The reason why I did that is even though these are really bad, DRO LNBs compared to PLL are really bad, there are some differences that are going to be very useful for some DIY amateur radio projects that you cannot do with a PLL LNB. And it is very rare to find actual unused new DRO LNBs being sold, at least here. Usually I would have to get them secondhand after they've been used for many years sitting on the roof. So this is still very useful just not for for its intended purpose. This is one of the new LNBs I bought and before we actually tear it down you will notice that the plastic casing has been sort of melted back together so there is no non-destructive way to take this apart so to save us time what I did if I can find the box over here I marked it is I already <laughs> I already opened up one beforehand. Not completely, I just basically cut open the plastic shell. So I won't have to do that on video because it has took probably over an hour. So first off, let's take a look at the overall shape and kind of the construction of the LNB. One of the reasons why I bought it in the first place was that it's, its kind of shape is unique with the connector being in line with the LNB entrance. This is usually how your normal LNB would look like. So I thought that was interesting and I thought that could be useful for some projects before I knew it was a DRO LNB. Uh, because I had to destroy the case, I also decided to just go ahead and rip open the, the plastic cup that goes over the waveguide entrance. So we can actually take a look inside this one, which we weren't able to do in the previous video because I didn't want to destroy the case. But here it doesn't matter. We can see the two probes, we can see the vertical, which is... Actually, <laughs> I'm not sure which one is vertical because of the, of the inline connector. 
but one of them is vertical, one of them is horizontal when it's mounted in the dish, and it does the switching the same way as the PLLNB. Really, the only difference between DRO and PLLNB is the way it generates its local oscillator frequency. And to, to see that, we actually have to open it up. Uh, before we do that, I actually want to mention this. This is how I realized it's a DRO LNB. This is a signature of any DRO LNB. At least most of them, most of the ones I've opened up have this. These are under the silicone here are tuning screws for the two uh, DRO oscillators inside. One of them is for 9.75 gigahertz and the other for 10.6 gigahertz. That's your low and your high band. If you remember the Tesla LNB, the PLLNB, everything is done on chip, so you only need a single crystal oscillator reference. With a DRO LNB, you physically need to have two separate oscillators, each one of them with a different size, so it resonates at a different frequency. Uh, when you are taking apart a DRO LNB, this one is convenient because it has the tuning screws on the other side. Some of them have the tuning screws in between the normal, normal ones. Actually, this one is a DRO LNB as well, and you can see that the tuning screws of the DROs are on the same side as the as the screws that hold the case closed. So if you intend to actually be using the DRO LNB, try not to mess with these screws unless you actually want to retune it. Only take up take off the screws that actually hold it together and don't take out the tuning screws. Right, I took all the screws out. Again, it's a Torx head, just like most LNBs are. And I think I forgot to mention this in the in the beginning. The name of the LNB, it's made by Inverto and it's a red classic single straight feed 40mm LNB. I'm not sure if Inverto actually makes these anymore and sells them as new or if I just or if just the distributor where I got it is selling these as new. No, let's let's stop talking about this and let's actually take a look inside the LNB. I took out the screws and I'm now gonna try and reach inside and lift the RF shield just throw that out and we can see inside the LNB and we should be able to see the the date on the PCB and my hands are shaking a lot as always is 2011 so not even 2012 as I as I misremembered so here we have the exposed PCB I mounted it in a quite unstable way so yeah it's probably going to shake around a little bit anyway uh, we can immediately spot some differences between this and the and the PLLNB, which we took apart last time. First of all, there is still an integrated circuit over here. However, that is only for for the polarization and band switching, I believe. So that's what's going to detect your, your voltage signaling and the 22 kilohertz high band signal coming from the IF. We can't actually see the DROs here because they are on the other side of the PCB, which I guess is a, is a good way to make the LNB because normally if you take apart a DRO LNB and the DROs are on this side of the PCB. Once you take the RF shield off, you have completely messed up their tuning. I suppose this is more, this is a better way to construct it, but again, you don't really expect DROs nowadays anyway. So the two oscillators would be under, under this shielded portion of the PCB. You can see one, one trace is going in this way with a bypass capacitor for each one of them. That is the, the power for the amplifier or whatever is driving the DRO. I don't actually know how DROs work, nobody does. Uh, that's, a, that's a little known fact. But once you apply power to the DRO, which I believe runs around three volts, I measured this on the, on the original LNB, your local oscillator signal comes out from either one of these points. Uh, so, you, you have two oscillators there, one of them is tuned to 9.75 GHz, I believe that's the one on the right side, and the one on the left side is tuned for 10.6 GHz. Uh, this chip, depending on the voltage that is supplied to the LNB, the chip will power up only one of the DROs, and the signal from the DRO will come, off, come out into this, this point of the, of the PCB. You can see the two parallel tracks here with a little air gap between them. This, I believe, is the mixer. So there are your antenna connectors. One of them is for vertical, one of them is for horizontal. Both of them are actually at 45 degrees, so I'm not sure which, which is which. You have your first stage amplifiers, as always. They converge into this point. You have a second stage amplifier. 
and this is the filter so again that's that's a difference between this and the previous LNB uh, the previous one had the sort of squiggly, squiggly line filter and this one only has a this notch protruding from the trace which is acting as a band pass filter somehow no again I have no idea how uh, because this is a DC shorted filter, we need a capacitor here and we have our ter third stage amplifier which finally goes into the mixer. So this is where your RF comes in, your actual radio frequencies. This is where your LO signal comes in. And I believe this really thin trace is how the IF frequencies, the actual UHF and L band uh, results of the down conversion come out and this would probably be an IF amplifier. Yeah, that's the general way the the DRO LNB works. So normally with a PLL LNB, you would not have the mixer visible like this at all. You would not have the IF amplifier visible. You would ha just have a single chip right here. RF comes in and IF comes out. Here we actually see the mixer exposed on the PCB over here. And that is also the reason why I bought so many of them, because with the mixer exposed like this, we have access to basically every single part of the LNB and we can do uh, really strange things to it. To, for example, make it transmit instead of receive, which I've already already tried doing and it, it worked actually, which, which was surprising. The DRO LNB can also be retuned, although I suppose that's also the case with PLL LNBs if you switch their reference oscillator frequency. But overall, the PCB is similar, the kind of function is similar. Again, the major difference being that the mixer is a, is a discrete part here and you need both oscillators for both frequencies and it's using a different style of filter. Now, unfortunately, I won't be able to show you the DROs without desoldering the board, I think, because I have not found a way to access them from the other side of the case. So I'm gonna do that off screen and I'll, I'll include some, some pictures of how, how they look like. Uh, they are basically little packs of, of ceramic or some other dielectric material. Again, I have no idea. And their physical size and uh, the size and shape of the, of the resonant cavity they are in determines which frequency they are going to resonate at. Which is why the 10.6 GHz DRO is actually physically smaller than the 9.75 GHz one. You can probably see slight difference in there because obviously you want it to resonate at a higher frequency, so it needs to be shorter for the shorter wavelength. Even me doing this probably has detuned the LNB slightly, which is why you usually have tuning screws accessible from outside of the, of the LNB case, so you can manually adjust them. They do that in the factory and then they seal them so you can't mess with it anymore. I'm going to put this LNB back together again and we're gonna i'm gonna use a different one actually and we are going to do a test on on the signal receiving to see what its precision is what its stability is and i've actually come up with a way to do this better than last time and well i'll explain all of that once we actually get outside so we have the lnb mounted on the dish and the setup is a little bit more stable than last time i have the dish finally on a fixed pipe uh, Currently, it's aimed at the Q100 satellite, as you can see. But the idea is that I keep the LNB powered up for around 30 minutes, so the oscillator inside has time to stabilize and warm up. And then I'm gonna do a recording of the Q100 satellite, so we can try listening to some of the narrowband USB signals, just like before. Uh, upper sideband signals, of course. And after that, I will most likely switch to the Astra 3B beacon which has a nice strong uh, constant wave in the middle. Uh, I'm going to do the exact same thing with all three LNBs. So with this LNB, with the Tesla LNB and the Bullseye LNB. So we can compare all, all three once it's done. Uh, I'll record a few minutes of Q100 traffic. Then I will rotate the dish, aim it at Astra 3B and record a few minutes of its beacon to do the, the stability measurements. Right, and here we are with the final recordings that I've made with the with the DRO Inverto LNB. Uh, we're, we're going to start with Q100 just like before, and we're gonna try listening to some of the narrowband, single sideband uh, voice transmissions because uh, 
with those you kind of get to actually hear hear the LNB drift since you your brain is wired up to recognize a human voice and you'll immediately be able to figure out when there's something really really wrong and there there is something really wrong with this LNB so let's turn on the audio and let's find some some voice transmission yeah and you can immediately hear it that there is a lot of drift and instability in the in this LNB. Even when I constantly adjust the tuning frequency, it just keeps going up. And there really is no no way to get get a nice stable voice. And we can see this instability if we go to the low beacon, for example. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was supposed to be a constant tone. Th that, this, these are supposed to be just straight lines. You can tell why the RO LNBs are not very nice. Uh, we have some KGS TV transmission, just like last time. I don't think I'm gonna bother trying to decode this. Look at, look at how unstable it is. We can take a look at the middle beacon. Yeah, it's just dancing around. This LNB is not very stable at all. And to see that even better, I recorded a sample from one of the television satellites. Should be this one. So this is a telemetry beacon. Similar to Astra 3B, but it's not Astra 3B, it's some it's some other geostationary satellite that just happens to be sitting on a very similar position to QO100 or SL2. And if we if we zoom in. Yeah, this is supposed to be just a straight line, a constant frequency tone. And it's not, it's not at all. It sounds like, like a boiling kettle. <laughs> However, since the last time we did things like this, I've actually created this. This is a GNU radio flowchart, which actually properly measures the frequency drift of the LNB so I'm probably not gonna explain how it works because it's really stupid and the best thing I'm can, I can do right now is just turning it on I'm gonna enable the throttle so the computer doesn't doesn't die immediately and what this flowchart does is it takes the uh, signal recording file similarly to how we have just played it back in SDR Sharp. It takes a recording of one of the telemeter beacons which has a very strong constant wave down the middle right here. That's a nice strong peak that we can use to measure the frequency drift. Uh, there's a PLL carrier tracking block which locks onto the carrier and centers it down to 0 Hz offset. And here you can see the unlocked original, how it's how it's drifting. And then using a PL frequency detector block and some some resampling, some delay, and so on, we are essentially measuring the difference between where this peak is currently and where it was exactly one second ago, which is displayed over here. Now this display actually isn't it doesn't work properly, I don't know why, for some reason it only displays the value once around every 5 or 4 seconds. I haven't figured it out, but it doesn't matter because this is just for for like debug purposes. Uh, what this flowchart actually does is it saves it into a binary file. It saves the offsets in the, in the file on the computer. And then I have a Python script which reads this file because it's saved as 32-bit floats. It reads this file. Uh, this was entirely actually written by ChatGPT, which I thought would be interesting to point out. I have not done anything with this code. But what this essentially does when we run it and put the name of the of the of the file. What this does it is is it displays 
the last 120 values in the file so that way so the recordings are around 2 minutes and 15 seconds long which means we get 15 seconds at the beginning for the PLL carrier tracking for the PLL carrier tracking to kind of stabilize and and lock onto the carrier and then we just disregard those samples because those are the samples before the PLL carrier was locked and we only read 120 of the last one so that's 120 seconds worth of data and what I do with that is I import it to Google Sheets and I calculate the average which is here and as you can see I've made a nice little table comparing the three LNBs that we've had on the channel so far we get the average drift value which is right here you can see the inverto LNB on account of it being a DRO LNB it's really bad uh, you want to be as close to zero as possible and you can see of course the bullseye LNB is the most stable one with an average drift of only around 6 Hz per second and that's an absolute value so it doesn't matter if it's drifting up or down since you don't care if it's going up or down you just care if it is going somewhere at all and how often you have to retune if you are using the LNB for amateur radio I've also measured the LNB the local oscillator error although as it's as is noted down here this isn't really a useful measurement because for example I can measure the LO at one point 30 minutes after it's powered up and it the the error the offset may not be that big however as it keeps drifting if I measured it 30 minutes later once again this value these values will be completely different so this is just kind of for informational purposes only this value or I guess this value where it's normalized to parts per billion is what really we want to be looking at anyway yeah uh, that's the test that I've come up with I realized it's not it's it's still not very good there's probably much much better ways to achieve all of this you can see how, how much garbage I have on on the taskbar just trying to get this work but it did work in the end I think it checks out. I think the math checks out and we can see indeed exactly the result that we've expected. The bullseye LNB, which is made to be the most stable one, achieves the lowest drift per second. And the DRO LNB, the Inverto Red Classic Single Straight LNB, achieves the worst drift because, well, it's an old DRO LNB just being sold in, in a new case, basically. Anyway, that probably concludes this video. There really isn't much more I can talk about. I just wanted to take a look at the DRO LNB after we've seen the PL LNB so that we could sort of evaluate the differences and do these measurements. Thank you for watching, as always. As I've said at the beginning, I, I really want to continue the satellite reception series since that's what most people are coming to the channel for, probably thanks to the RTL SDR blog. But, as I've said, I want to do the HRPT episode, or at least the introduction episode to HRPT, and currently there's an ongoing situation that sort of needs to needs to conclude before before I feel it's appropriate to make the video. Just so I don't release it and a day later half of its information immediately becomes obsolete. So, yeah. That's the status of the series. That concludes this video, thank you for watching and hope to see you next time.